Дорогие друзья, добрый день. Мы продолжаем цикл публичных лекций. Мы стараемся встречать, организовывать встречи для нашей передовой украинской молодежи с самыми интересными людьми. Для того, чтобы, в общем-то, ну, вы напитывались. Слушали, думали, задавали вопросы, чтобы вы знали, чем живет мир, и все лучшее потом применяли в своей жизни и в жизни нашей любимой страны. Вы знаете, если кто-то заметил, ну я говорю, это так и есть, раньше мы отдавали больше приоритет встрече, ну, встречам с выдающимися политиками. И у вас таких встреч было много, и, в общем-то, это ну, здорово. С президентом Пересом, с Биллом Клинтоном, Тони Блэйром, ну и со многими другими ведущими. Постепенно вот, мы стали понимать, что очень важно сегодня докопаться, попытаться докопаться до более глубинных корней, сегодняшних проблем, потому что в мире сегодня идут тектонические изменения, и даже лучшие политики в лучшем, в лучшем случае могут на них только реагировать, пытаться их менеджировать. Но даже у самых лучших политиков нет глубинного понимания корней, глубинных корней этих проблем. И я стал думать, а как же с этим работать, как с этим быть? Я пришел к выводу, и мы в фонде пришли к выводу, что для того, чтобы понять, для того, чтобы понимать и говорить про именно глубинные проблемы, почему мы сегодня являемся свидетелями и участниками этих глубинных, фундаментальных, тектонических изменений в мире, нужно говорить с интеллектуалами, с учеными. И если раньше, в предыдущие несколько десятилетий, даже в роли этих интеллектуалов, ученых, выступали экономисты, то даже экономисты, ведущие экономисты, нобелевские лауреаты, но даже они находились, так сказать, пользовались ну, все равно вторичной информацией. Они говорили, конечно, какие должны быть реформы, как делать, как повышать. ВВП, как делать экономические реформы, но даже они не, не могли думать правильно, думать и правильно докапываться до глубинных проблем, как устроен современный мир и что двигает изменения. И мы пришли к пониманию, что, в общем-то, очень важно встречаться и общаться и беседовать с с историками, ну, те, кто занимается прикладной историей, э, с философами, с психологами. Эти люди, именно эти люди, которые на острие этих исследований, они могут лучше всех других хотя бы дать нам намек, показать направление, куда, как, куда и как нужно думать, чтобы понять, что происходит в современном мире. Ну, в общем, такая, так, решил с вами просто поделиться, почему мы немножко смещаем фокус в последнее время на ваших встречах с выдающимися умами современности, с выдающимися интеллектуалами. И вот сегодня у нас встреча э, с одним из таких людей. Знаете, можно его э, в каком-то смысле, его можно, я могу его называть э, рок-стар современной ну, прикладной истории и выдающийся ум, профессор Ельского университета, огромный друг Украины, огромный знаток Украины и вообще нашей части света. И я хочу, чтобы вы присоединились к моему приветству. Please welcome Тимоти Снайдер.
just one word, one, one last word. Это будет лекция, после которой мы сможем еще задавать вопросы. Я буду стараться быть, как говорится, сейчас моду, быть вашим слугой, я буду у вас модератором. Все. Тимоти, floor is yours. So, first of all, I, I want to say to the students again, congratulations. Today is your day. It's not my day. It's your day. I'm just the decoration, right? It's like today is your birthday and I'm just the cake. So, please, please think about it this way because this, this day is your day and I'm very happy for all of you and that I have the chance to meet you. Uh, Mr. Pinchuk has asked me to speak about Ukraine and the future of Europe. But because I'm a historian, there is a certain risk that I'll start by talking about the past. And I'm not going to apologize for doing this because, you see, it's actually impossible to have a future if you can't think about the past. If you don't know where you're coming from, there's no way you know where you're going. And this is actually a basic problem of politics and democratic politics today. We're all stuck in a permanent now. We're all going round and round in circles all of the time. We're all stuck in a moment where we talk about us and them, and in and out. Whereas if you want to have a democracy, you have to be able to say, here are the projects, here are the facts, here is how we can move forward. Without a future, there's no democracy, but also without democracy, there isn't a future. Now, as a historian, I think that historical time, the ability to think about what's behind us is an essential part of thinking about what's ahead of us. If you are voting in a democratic election, at least in normal circumstances, you're thinking about what's happened in the past, how my decision today matters, and what the possible futures are. In fact, I would propose that the interesting thing about the spring, summer, and fall of 2019 in Ukraine is that these elections are so clearly about futures that no one can predict, right? And insofar as that's true, history is all the more important. So I'm going to start by telling you what I think the big question of history is, and then I'll conclude by saying how you are the answer, right? You know that's where I'm going to end, right? I'm going to say you're, you're the answer. So the, the big question of history, the big question of European history, and there really is only one, is what do you do after empire? That is the only question that matters. The history of Europe is a history of empire, whether it's Portugal or Spain, whether it's Germany or Italy, whether it's France, or I don't have to tell you, even Poland, um, it's a history of empire. Okay, the Canadian Ukrainians thought that was funny. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll note that. Um, it, the, the history of Europe is a history of empire. The tragedies of the 20th century, the tragedies at which Ukraine is in the absolute center, are tragedies which have to do with attempts to make empire continue. So the Soviet Union is a new kind of empire. Joseph Stalin, when he's thinking about how to make the Soviet Union, basically says, I have to do all the things that the other empires did but I have to do them on my own territory to my own people. That's what collectivization of agriculture was about. That's what the famine in Ukraine in large measure was about. 
the attempt to create an empire in your own country. The invasion of the Soviet Union in 1941 by Nazi Germany was also imperial. It was an attempt to create an old-fashioned empire in the middle of Europe itself. The main German war aim in 1941 was to turn Ukraine into a colony. Hitler again and again referred to Ukraine as being like India, or like Africa, or like America. It was a colonial territory which the best Europeans were going to conquer. So you, the, the, the only story in European history, the only story that matters is the story of what you do after empire. In this story, Ukraine plays an absolutely central role because Ukraine is at the very center. Ukraine is the country which has suffered the most in the mainstream of European history. Now, the, there's an answer to this question. I mean, there's a right answer to this question of what to do after empire. There are also some wrong answers. Um, the wrong answers are things like, let's have more empire, um, which is the foreign policy of your northern neighbor. Um, there are other wrong answers like, let's have a tiny little isolated nation state and see how that works out. There is a right answer which the Europeans have found and which the Europeans alone have found which is to build up some kind of pro a process of integration which strengthens states by bringing states together. So the grand transformation in European history has been the end of empire and the creation of a Europe which brings states together. Um, so now, where, where then do we go from here? How do we think about Ukraine in all of this? My second historical point, and this is again why I think you have to think about the past. Don't worry, I'm gonna to get to the part where I say you're the future and we need you. That's gonna come. We're gonna to get to the part where I say people under 25 have to solve all the problems of the world. Don't worry, that's inevitable, right? That's coming. But before I get there, I want to make another point about the past, a related point about the past, which is that at every single turning point in European history, Ukraine has been there. At every point where we've moved from one kind of state to another kind of state, one kind of political system to another kind of political system, this place, Kiev, has always been at the center. So in the early Middle Ages, um, when the medieval kingdoms were established, usually by wandering Vikings, Kiev was at the center. When in, the, when in the, the early modern period, the state is changed because religion moves from being one thing to many things, Kiev is also at the center. This process of reformation and counter-reformation is more complicated and more interesting here than, than anywhere else. When in the late 19th century we move into an age of world empire where a few countries control the entire globe, again Ukraine is at the center. When a revolution is made in 1917 and followed by a process of transformation, again Ukraine is at the center. When Germany invades Eastern Europe, Ukraine is at the center. When the Soviet Union ceases to exist, Ukraine is at the center. So there are two reasons why I think the past tells us that Europe's future depends very much on Ukraine. The first is that the big question, there's only one big question, how do you get from empire to Europe? That big question has to involve Ukraine. The second is that at every other major turning point, not just the one we're at now, but at every other major turning point, Ukraine was at the center. Now, that's one way of looking at this issue. Um, and in a way, it's a very comfortable way to look at the issue. Because what I'm saying is, you're so important 
that it can't possibly happen without you. However, that's not the way that history works. History is about two things. It's about structures, which I've tried very briefly to describe, and then it's about choices. And the way that history has to do with democracy is, if you know something about the structures, then you can make more informed choices. In other words, the more you know about the past as it actually was, which is very different from what they teach you in school, and it's very different from what the ministries in charge of memory will tell you. It's always different from what the grown-ups tell you, by the way. Um, history is always more interesting than what you're taught in school. Um, if it weren't, I would be doing something else right now, right? I would have a different job. So um, it, history has to do with democracy because if you can fight your way into seeing what the past is really like for your country, then you can also fight your way into seeing possibilities for the future which are not obvious. So what I'd now like to do is suggest the other side of the question. That is, it, since you have an opportunity, how would you actually make that opportunity work for you? Because here's the thing, Europe needs you, but nobody knows that. Right? I mean, there, there, no, there are a lot of relationships which take this form. You may be involved in one of them right now. Very often, one side needs another side, but they don't know it. Europe's relationship to Ukraine is very much like this. Europe will not continue to exist without Ukraine. Um, the world is a world of empire and solutions to empire. There are no third ways. If Europe is going to continue to exist, it's going to continue to exist by expanding and by bringing in new members, and the most important of those is, is Ukraine. But what Europe needs more than anything else is a future, right? Everything that I've told you about so far is the European past and how the Ukrainian past fits into the European past. And Europeans are very comfortable with the past. In European politics, people are very comfortable with the present and talking about how since the past was bad, then maybe the present is better. But you might have noticed that somewhere along the way, the future got murdered, right? Not in Ukraine. Ukraine is interestingly different. But in Europe, no one is able to talk about the future. In my country, which has no other problems, otherwise everything is perfect. In my, that was a joke, you gotta laugh at that point. In my country, thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, in, in my country, we have also completely lost the ability to talk about the future. Maybe it's starting to come back. But the Europeans don't have the ability to talk about the future. This is what they need. So this thing that people call populism, everybody's worried about populism. Right? Everyone thinks populism is a big problem. What is populism? Populism is democracy minus the future. That's what populism is. Populism is politics where I keep telling you about a national past where you were innocent and other people were guilty. And we do that forever. That's what populism is. It's democracy without the future. Um, Europe's problem with populism is a problem of not knowing what the future is or being afraid of the future. For a while, Europe had a future which was called enlargement. So according to the Europeans, or according to many Europeans, history was supposed to end somewhere around 1992. Communism was over. They had just created something called the European Union. But what happened instead was that a number of East European countries, former communist countries, knocked on the door, knocked on the door to the European Union. And by doing so, they created a future for Europe, right? The Europeans don't know they need a future, okay? This is a secret that I'm sharing with you, all right? They don't know they need, oh, sorry. There are some Europeans here. 
I blew it. <laughs> okay. Um, oh well. So they don't, they don't know they need a future. The process of enlarging the European Union in the 1990s and 2000s until 2013 was giving the European Union a future. The future of Europe ended somewhere around 2013. And this is why Maidan is so interesting, right? I mean, of course, for Ukrainians, Maidan is interesting and important for all kinds of ways, for the solidarity that it involves, for the sacrifices that people made, for the friendships and the memories that it left behind. But from the point of view of Europe, what's interesting about Maidan was that it was about the European future. In 2014, the only people talking about a European future were Ukrainians. And that is a gift. That is something that's very precious and something that's very important. And the, the reason why that discussion came to an end, of course, is the invasion from the East um, and the inability of Europe to deal with that situation. Now, what can Ukrainians do now? What do Ukrainians have to offer to a Europe which needs a future but maybe doesn't know that it needs a future? I'm going to close by making just a handful of suggestions about what this place has to offer for a, a European future. Because here's the thing about the future. By its nature, it's unpredictable, right? So we don't know whether or not Ukraine is going to play a role in the European imagination. What I'm saying is that it could, and from your point of view, it better, right? That Europe needs more imagination. It needs to have visions and possibilities, and that Ukraine might be able to supply some of those. How so? Okay, before I talk about the weirder, more fantastic stuff, I have to talk about the rule of law. Ukraine is not going to be joining the European Union in your lifetimes without the rule of law. You know that, but it's required that anybody from the West who ever gives a speech in Ukraine says rule of law. So now I can check that off, rule of law. Okay, I mean, it's important, but you've heard it all before. Now let me try to get to the more interesting things. There are, there are bits of Ukraine which the West can't do without, which we have seen in the last few years. One of them is investigative reporting. Many things that I know about America, I know because of Ukrainians or Russians, right? Independent investigative reporting by people who travel and talk to other human beings is a precious natural resource. Without independent reporters in Ukraine, no one understands the war, no one understands Crimea, no one understands Donbass. And I would suggest also in the future, no one in the West is going to understand Russia unless Ukrainian reporters are given the support they need to cover their own region. Um, second related point, Ukrainian culture. It's not just a compliment to say it, it's true. Since Maidan, for the last five years, since Maidan, Ukrainian literary and visual culture and musical culture and theatrical culture has probably been the most interesting in Europe. This is a gift, right? This is a, this is a gift and it's a possibility. You're starting to reach the point where Ukrainian culture is going to hit a European mainstream. This is something to be exploited. Okay, now for the last thing and for perhaps the most interesting thing, how to say this. I've been speaking English this whole time, right? Um, but you haven't for a moment thought that I'm from England. That hasn't occurred to you. It is normal that international languages have many homes. So the French language has a home in Quebec, right? The French language has homes in Africa, not just in France. I'm coming to you from Austria. The German language has a home in Austria. It has a home in Switzerland. It has a home in Germany. It's different in each of those places. If you're, on, if you're using your computer and you're writing in German, you choose which dictionary. Do you want Francais Francais or Francais Québécois? 
do you want Schweizer, wait, do you want Swiss German? Or do you want Austrian German? Do you want German German? If you're writing in English, you say, do you want Australian English, American English, Canadian English, British English? But what about if you're writing in Russian? There's only one Russian, and that is historically very strange. When the American state was established, the very first thing that Americans did was to write their own dictionaries, was to take the language for themselves. So for me, it's normal that the Ukrainian language should be supported and advanced. For me, it's normal that people speak Ukrainian in public. Um, Ja hovoriu v tomu misti ukrajinskom ovoju v 25 rokiv i zaraz ludi do mene ukrajinskoju vypovidaju. It's a duže harno. It's a duže harno. Ale, um, but, but having said that, I think it's time for Ukrainians to recognize that it's a mistake to leave Russian culture to the Russian Federation. You have an immense opportunity in this country to write the Russian dictionaries and to train the journalists who report on Russia for the rest of the world, um, and to supply to the Russians themselves information about their own country. This is a mission, but I just want to stress, it's totally normal. We have our own American English dictionaries. That's normal. It would be normal for you to have an Ukrainsky Derzhavny Institut Rosyskoi Mobi Takulture. That would be normal. And if you had such a thing, it would not only change the way that the language question works in Ukraine, it would become a way of projecting your own culture outwards into the world. There are a lot of people, not just in the Russian Federation, but in Kazakhstan, Israel, the United States, and Canada, who live in the Russian language. It's a mistake, I think, not to take advantage of this opportunity. So to put the question in a different way, what does Ukraine have to offer a European future? What about a version of Russian culture which is European? I'll close on that. Thank you very much. Professor Snyder, thank you very much for your uh, very strong, very inspirational and informative intellectual intervention, introduction. Uh, now we have time for questions. Maybe I will use opportunity, I will ask first question, but after that floor will be open for everybody. Uh, you already started to talk about role of Ukraine for the future of Europe. Uh, from my point of view, maybe I'm wrong, you didn't mention one critically important role for the future of Europe. And I want just to put this on, uh, on the table and ask you if you agree with this or not. I think Ukraine has absolutely unique chance. If Ukraine will be able to tell a successful story how uh, post-Soviet, Slavic, Orthodox country will become successful democracy market economy, it, creates, it will create existential threat for last uh, European empire. And I think it's one of the most uh, important role which Ukraine can play for the future of Europe. What do you think about that? Oh, I, I agree completely with that. I think it's very important, smaller point, that Europeans look at Ukraine and say, 
there is no clash of civilizations. Uh, pe people, can, people can create the rule of law because they decide to. That we Europeans can't say those people are Oriental or Byzantine or other in some fundamental way. I think that's very important. But the, the, the larger point, and I agree with you here too, is Russia. Um, so there is, there is no stable point in history. Nothing is ever really at rest. And the same is true with democracy. There's never a stable point. It's never true that democracy is just arrived, right? People talk about a transition. There's no such thing as a transition. In democracy, you never reach a point where you're safe. You never go over the hill and suddenly you just have a view of democracy ahead of you forever. That's not how democracy works. Democracy is a fight. You know this better than me. It's a fight in your own country, but it's also a fight around the world. And in a fight, you're either, a, you're either going forward or you're going back. So I'm saying all this because there is no middle ground in Ukraine, in Eastern Europe. There's no middle ground. And, and as, as, as Mr. Pinchuk suggests, uh, Mr. Putin understands this very well. Democracy will either advance from Ukraine eastwards, or democracy will retreat from Ukraine into the European Union. There is no th third way. So it's, it, and this is why, you know, my Russian friends look at Ukraine with hope, right? I mean, I'm not saying every Russian is my friend or that every Russian looks at Ukraine with hope, but my Russian friends look at Ukrainian elections and say, oh, it's nice that surprising things can happen, right? It's, yeah, well, it is surprising, right? Um, it's nice that surprising things can happen because democracy is unpredictable, right? Authoritarianism is predictable. It's boring. That's its weakness. Democracy is unpredictable. So it's very important for Russia, right? I mean, even if one didn't care about Ukraine, which I do care about Ukraine very deeply, but even if one didn't care about Ukraine, the best thing to do for Russia is to show that a big post-Soviet country where some people speak Russian and some people go to Orthodox churches, where, uh, that this country can become a democracy and a successful one. I think that's extremely important. And I agree with you, that, is, that would be a gift for Europe. Thank you. Okay, now floor is open for your questions. Okay, somebody with a green t-shirt, you first, right? Okay, this young man, please. Today is your day. First question. Дякую, пане професоре. Скажіть, будь ласка, два коротеньких запитання. В своїй праці «Криваві землі» ви описуєте саме ті притаманні риси нацистській Німеччині, Радянському Союзу як тоталітарним режимом. І чи можемо ми говорити, що сьогодні вони не притаманні сучасним країнам, зокрема, і самі Російській Федерації? Чи вони продовжуються і розвиваються? І друге питання, чи врахувала, на вашу думку, Європа помилки 20-го століття, зокрема, часів Першої світової, коли ігнорувалися українські питання, і часів Другої світової, коли активно запроваджувалася політика умиротворення ворога? Ну, тієї самої нацистської Німеччини. Сьогодні Європа готова відмовитись від цього і дати якусь рішучу відповідь чи ні? Дякую. Please. So, I, I'm, not, I'm not going to be able to deal with all those questions adequately, but I will say a few things that are responsive. Um, so, let me start with the end. In, I spend a lot of my time trying to explain to Europeans the things that I'm saying here, namely that the European Union is part of a long history and that the European Union has to keep changing if it wants to exist. Um, I'm deeply convinced that that's true. However, I think you can never count on Europeans learning the correct lessons from the past. 
You can never count on anyone else learning the correct lessons from the past. You have to learn the lesson yourself and then try to apply it and then maybe convince the other person. So from my point of view, now moving to your second question, the interesting thing about the European Union is that it is the peace settlement of the First World War. Not the Second World War, but the First World War. Because the First World War was the moment when the land empires of Europe all fell apart. And countries like Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, Poland, Czechoslovakia, Austria were created. None of those countries actually survived more than 21 years. But now all of them exist, all those countries I mentioned, um, as members of the European Union. In other words, the European, what the European Union does is that it takes post-imperial states that would have problems on their own and creates a zone where they can be sovereign. Which brings me to Ukraine. So when I look at Ukraine after the First World War, it's, as, it, as you say, it's, it's actually a kind of typical case. Many more Ukrainians die, fight and die for independence than people in most European countries. Um, there are attempts, as you know very well, to establish a Ukrainian state, right? Two of them, a West Ukrainian state and a, and a Ukrainian state with its capital in Kiev. The reason that this doesn't work has nothing to do really with Ukrainians. It has to do with the fact that there's a Soviet Union and Ukraine is located where it is. Now, what I want to say is that's not exceptional. It's actually typical. It's, it's very, very typical because the Poles and the Romanians, they didn't succeed either. The Hungarians and the Czechoslovaks and the Estonians, none of your neighbors actually succeeded in building nation states. The thing that happens to the, you know, to, to the U Ukrainian National Republic after three years happens to everyone else after 20. But it's the same story. The same story is if you want to establish a nation state, it's best to have some higher level of politics that you can appeal to. So I wouldn't count on the Europeans learning this lesson unless you repeat it to them over and over and over again. But it's, it's, if, you're, if you're building a state, I think it's the correct lesson. Building a state means building a state that's good enough to join a higher level of politics if that higher level of politics is available. Okay, I should probably stop there because there are other people. Okay, thank you. Yeah, please, next question. Okay, please. And please introduce us. Thank you, thank you, Ambassador of the Netherlands. I'm sorry uh, to take the floor. I don't, I'm not wearing a green uh, T-shirt, but it's not every day that we have the opportunity to ask a question to such a distinguished uh, historian. So uh, thank you very much for your um, extremely interesting introduction. I was intrigued, uh, Mrs. Snyder, by your observation that history actually consists of the question what to do after empire. And uh, I was wondering, um, if we look at the um, collapse or the end of the Ottoman Empire, and we saw the uh, war in Yugoslavia, former Yugoslavia in the 90s of last century, if we could consider these wars a aftermath of an endgame of the collapse of the Ottoman Empire. The same maybe uh, for the uh, Empire, uh, the Habsburg Empire, the collapse of the Habsburg Empire and the separation later uh, between the Czech Republic and the Slovak Republic. Uh, could that also be maybe considered as a, an aftermath or an endgame of the collapse of the Habsburg Empire? And then we come to the collapse of the Soviet Union. Um, the the um, difficult relations between uh, Ukraine and, and Russia at the moment um, to be considered maybe also as an aftermath or an endgame of the uh, collapse of the Soviet Union. And then my question basically is, um, could identity be the answer to your question as to what to do after the end of an empire? Could identity. Yeah, yeah, no, I got it. Okay, so you're the, the ambassador from the, the Netherlands. So I will talk about the Ottoman Empire, but I first want to talk about the Netherlands. Um, so if you look at the Netherlands today, 
you see this nice, prosperous trading country with a European identity, right? And you could look at the Dutch and you could say, well, surely these people have always been this small country, maritime nation, likes to trade with its neighbors, and so on and so forth. But the Dutch are actually typical of Europe. The Dutch are not, I'm not a Dutch diplomat. The, D the Dutch are not actually this nice country that always likes to trade with its neighbors. The Dutch, like most important West European countries, are a former empire. Or as I like to think of it, a recovering empire, right? The Dutch, like most of the important European countries, have a 500-year-old imperial past, and the, what they do in the 21st century is recover from that in this beautiful project known as the European Union. So there's a nice story about the European Union, which is that the West European countries learned from the Second World War that war was bad. But that's not true. They didn't learn that war was bad. In the 1970s and 1980s, they started talking about how war was bad. But they didn't learn from the Second World War that war was bad. If they had learned from the Second World War that war was bad, they would have stopped fighting wars, which they didn't do. So right after the Second World War, the Dutch prosecuted a war in the Dutch East Indies in which they lost 75,000 soldiers, 75,000. Um, major military operations over four years, a war that they finally lost, in part because the Americans wouldn't pay for it. Um, why am I saying all of this? Because this is the true story of the European Union. Um, the question for the Netherlands, like for everyone else, is what do you do after empire? When the Dutch were starving in 1944, and they were starving, at the end of the Second World War, they said, the empire will save us, right? But that turned out not to be true. What saved them in the end was Europe. There's this, I, I just say this because everywhere you look in European history, this is the story, what to do after empire. So very briefly on your question, because it's a broad question, the end of the Ottoman Empire, the end of the Habsburg Empire, the end of the Soviet Union have in common one basic thing, which is that they create a bunch of nation states. And um, empires, so the reasons empires work is that they're big. And the reason empires eventually have problems is that they are unequal. When you break empires into nation states, you have something that's small, usually too small. But if you can find a way to make that too small thing exist in an equal relationship with other too small things, then you have a chance. So the, the whole history of the end of the Ottoman Empire is of nation states that fight each other for territory for 100 years <laughs> leading to the First World War. After the Habsburg monarchy, new states are created, all of which ceased to exist in the Second World War. After the Soviet Union, we have a whole bunch of new states which in my view, have to find a way to be together on some basis of equality. And I, I, the reason I tell the history this way is not just that I think it's true, it's also because I'm trying to remind Europeans that the Ukrainian story is just a more intense version of their own story. Thank you, very interesting. Okay, uh, from uh, that side, okay, this girl, yes, yeah, please. Uh, thank you for an um, interesting lecture. Uh, I'm Associate Professor of uh, University of Educational Management and uh, Senior Researcher in Institute of Social Psychology. And my question will concern trust in government and governmental institutions. A week ago, I discussed this issue uh, with the President of um, uh, Board of Psychologists uh, of Venice Region in Padova. And uh, I'm interested to hear um, historical perspective. Uh, trust in government and governmental institutions. Um, what is uh, the role of it in building future of Ukraine and Europe? Because in my personal opinion, which can be not shared by organizations where I, where I work, is that um, the situation, annexation of Crimea and the war in the east of Ukraine, roots of uh, that partly lie in uh, high distrust in government and governmental institutions of Ukraine among local population, and uh, definitely con connected to corruption. 
and um, actions of uh, police, prosecution, state security. Um, so in a historical perspective, um, the, uh, the precise question is uh, how uh, can we build our future concerning trust in government? So, go government isn't government if it's not trusted. If it's not trusted, it's something else besides a government. It's a regime, right? It's a state. But government means that you agree to be governed. So your question is a very important one. If there isn't trust, it's not really government. It's something else. This is a Ukrainian, Ukrainian weakness and Ukrainian strength. And by the way, the Poles have exactly the same story. Um, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a weakness in the sense that you can't get to a certain level of economic development without impersonal trust. So in the United States, I don't trust my neighbor's politics at all, but I do trust in his economic performance, more or less, right? I don't trust, you know, I don't trust my governor's politics at all, but I do more or less trust that he's not corrupt, more, more or less, right? You can't have, econ so the market, there's, no, the, there's no, the invisible hand of the market, the so-called invisible hand of the market, is impersonal trust, that you trust people who you don't know, who you're never going to see, who you don't have to kiss and you don't have to bribe, right? That's, that's, so you can't have, it's not called government if there's no trust, and you can't really have a market without trust. So trust is then something which has to be built up, and the question is, how do you build it up? And the only way to build it up is to give people palpable individual experiences which things, with things that work like a uni one university that's not corrupt, right, is a, is a, is a good start. Or um, one police department, right? You have to start from people's everyday experiences and then build, build your way back up. But this is, I mean, you, you're touching on a question which is central to state formation all across Europe. It's not special to Ukraine. The, the French peasant also distrusted the French government until the 20th century. Um, the, American, the Americans still have a bit of an issue with this, right? And, but but the, ans part, the answer always has to do with finding something between the distant central government and the individual that works, which is why I thought the decentralization law was one of the good things that happened in Ukraine in, in the last few years. But I'm afraid that's as far as I can as, as, as I can go. You can't do without trust, but you also can't just, inv you can't just make trust out of nothing, right? Trust has to come from institutional relationships which become, which become predictable. And by the way, I'm hopeful that the political parties that now emerge and become more important will not just talk about this but actually perform it in, in daily life. I'm hopeful about that. Thank you. From that side, please. Thank you for your lecture. Um, I'm uh, your younger colleague, uh, also historian. My name is Maria. Uh, and uh, as you said, democracy is unpredictable. Sometimes it brings to authority Nazis or just stupid people. And uh, um, we had elections in Ukraine and we had a newly elected president who is kind of black swan, which is actually green. And I'm sure you, uh, paid attention uh, on uh, this process. And my question is, uh, how do you consider the results of this election in a historical point of view, from historical point of view? And uh, what are your predictions for next five years? I understand that short-term predictions are more complicated than long-term, but it will be interesting to hear your thoughts. So. I mean, r rather than directly answering your question, let me, I'm just going to name a few things that I think are interesting about the present situation. One thing which is very interesting is generational change, which may, you know, whatever one thinks about the individual, the change in generation 
may turn out to be one of the or maybe the most important consequences of 2019 in Ukraine. Um, because we're, we're talking about someone who is, who is very young, I mean, not young compared to you guys, but, but, but young from the point of view of being the president of a major country. And then other political figures who are now emerging are also relatively young. So generation, from, from my point of view, I mean, my view about Ukraine, I've been saying this for 30 years now, is that if the state can survive long enough to produce two new political generations, then everything is gonna be fine. And as I see it, the, this is the first new political generation. If these guys cannot mess things up for the next 15 years until these guys can get in power, then I think everything's gonna be all right. So my first point is generations. My second point is virtual reality and real reality. So the, all of us are dealing with the problem of how you translate the internet into real life. Because thus far, I mean, what the internet has done has been to colonize and take over more and more parts of real life. We haven't yet found a situation where something that arrives from the internet has then made reality better. I mean, maybe you have a different idea, but that's, that's how I see it. So in the case of Mr. Zelensky, we obviously have the case of, you know, this is a virtual phenomenon. Right? I mean, this is, this is a person who very skillfully and very intelligently um, created a sense of possibility for everyone, something like that. And that is possible before you're president. But now he's president. And so he is a very intense example of this basic question, can you take something from the digital world and turn it into something in the real world? I, I would prefer to see that not as a problem, but as a challenge. Um, a challenge for Mr. Zelensky and a challenge to, to, to everyone else. The third thing that I want to say is that it's for me personally, it is, this is just my judgment, and of course Ukrainians have, have much more of a right than me to have an opinion about this, but from my point of view, it's important to see the war in the southeast and the annexation of Crimea as something um, which can only be solved by creating a better Ukraine in the future. In other words, if one focuses all of one's attention on Crimea and the Donbass, and at the exclusion of everything else, you lose in Crimea and the Donbass. The way to win in Crimea and the Donbass is to create a better Ukraine elsewhere. And the way to create a better Ukraine elsewhere is to start making turns in, into the future. So I don't know what's gonna happen in the next five years. I mean, I, I will make a prediction for the next five months, which is that I think, um, I think parties that didn't exist two months ago are going to form a coalition. That's my prediction for the next two months. Thank you. Now, yeah. Um. Uh, so, my question would slightly be far away from the topic. Oh, yep. Okay. Uh, <laughs> I, uh, I give floor to another young lady, but okay, you will be first and you second. Okay. Thank you. Uh, but my question Please will... Please introduce yourself. My name is Olena. I'm a student. I study linguistics and literature. And I want to ask you about the uh, future fate of human sciences because it is vital for us to cherish them and uh, everybody understands that human sciences help us to understand the future better but more and more they are being neglected in universities like Oxford for example which is a good example but a sad example and my question is um, how to sustain a level when more and more people, academics and people in general, will understand the significance of human sciences and to sustain the level of studying them in the future and not neglect. Thank you. I, I, think, I think this is a wonderful, wonderful question um, for, for all of us because what has happened in the last 30 years is that we said, you know, history is over, 
there are no alternatives, liberal democracy is automatic, the market's going to bring it, or Europe is going to bring it. And therefore, we said, there are only how questions. There are no why questions. And this, of course, is a terrible mistake, right? Because if you think there are only how questions, then somewhere somebody else is providing the why questions. If a whole population is taught, all that matters is efficiency and optimization, then nobody asks, what's the point of it all? If everybody thinks democracy is only there to create conditions for efficiency or whatever, then nobody thinks, well, why does my choice matter as a person, as a unique, irreplaceable person? So your, I think your question is extremely important because if we don't have the humanities, we can't ask the why questions. And if we can't ask the why questions, then there really is no future. Because the only way to imagine the future is to say, the future would be better if X. But you can only say better by making a judgment about ethics or aesthetics or something which comes out of the humanities, the human sciences, as you say. So it's a, I'm now going to say a very old fashioned thing. Without poetry, without literature, without painting, and without music, there is no future because we're not able to imagine it. What happens instead is what we see so much now, which is that even though the world has more wealth and more technology than ever, no one has any idea what the future should be like, right? And people are afraid of everything all the time. So I, I'm agreeing with the premise of your question. I, I think it's extremely important, and none of the things that I'm talking about make any sense without the humanities. I mean, history, I think of history as a science, but I also think of it as a humanity. And it's, when its budget is cut, its budget is cut as a humanity, right? <laughs> which it is. And I mean, there's a, there's a great irony here, which is that we've now reached a moment where everyone is asking, what about the future? Are the machines going to take over, right? What should we do about genetic modification? All of these ethical questions are all around us, but nobody says, wait a minute, maybe we should be therefore paying philosophers and paying historians and, and paying people who actually work on these questions, right? That's the, that's the weird thing about the present moment. So I don't know how to solve this problem. I mean, the only thing that I know how to do is to go forward as a humanist into the world and try to, and try to answer these questions as best, as best I can. Um, I, but I think, I, think the, I think a way to talk about it in politics is that this is also a strategic question. If, you don't, if there aren't Ukrainian humanities, then it's very hard for Ukrainians to think about a Ukrainian future, right? That's the strategic element. And, and if, you, if, the, if, if there aren't Ukrainians thinking about a Ukrainian future based on Ukrainian art, music, literature, and so on, then somebody else's idea of the future will slip in, right? Thank you. Now, this is now your... Okay, thank you one more time. Um, I want to refer to your oh, please, last uh, please point. In, please introduce yourself. Um, my name is Ksenia. I'm working at the Business Ombudsman Council. So I want to refer to the last point mentioned in your speech about using um, Russian culture and Russian language in our favor. So what exactly do you mean? And uh, isn't it more important to uh, develop our own culture and focus on Ukrainian language? Thank you. Yes, it's much more important to develop Ukrainian language. Of course it is. It's much more important. Um, I mean, I've, as, as I said in my speech, I've been speaking Ukrainian in this city for 25 years. And only recently has that become a very pleasant experience, right? I, am, I speak Ukrainian when I'm in Dnipro. I always speak Ukrainian. 
and there's a reason for that. I mean, I, I am on the side of the culture which needs to be rehabilitated. I'm on the side of the culture which is being dominated by the international cultures, right? I even feel guilty speaking English, you know, because I think, well, everybody has to listen to English all the time. So yes, it is much more important. Let's say it's a thousand times more important to develop Ukrainian culture. However, it is not a choice, right? It's not that you say, we, be, because there's Ukrainization, therefore we can't do anything with Russian. That would be a mistake, I think. So, I mean, let me give you a different kind of example. There's only one moment in the history, the intellectual history of my country, where our elite learned a difficult foreign language, and that was the Cold War, when a significant number of Americans actually took the trouble to learn Russian. That was a good thing to do. It helped us a lot that we could read Russian documents. Like, I won't go into all the examples, but it made sense for us to invest in that culture because it allowed us to do things that otherwise we couldn't have done and to understand things that we couldn't have done. In this country, you already have Russian as an available resource. What, so you ask what to do. Again, to repeat, let's say it's one, let's say Ukrainian culture is a thousand times more important. But let's also say, let's just spend a few million euro, a few million euro a year on the following projects. Standardize the Russian language in a Ukrainian way. So that if there are Ukrainian newspapers or books published in Russian in this country, they are published with grammatical and punctuation rules that are Ukrainian, that are slightly different from Russian which means that if you look at a book, you can tell right away, what, even, if, even though it's in the Russian language, you can tell right away whether it's from Ukraine or from Russia, right? So when I look at a book, I can tell right away whether it's from Britain or the United States. And I react immediately, right? Because there's a different way of, there's different orthography, there's different grammar and so on. And the reason why is that the English language is standardized differently. So the first thing is standardize the Russian language. You have a right to do this. Everybody else with every other major language has already done it. The second thing is, um, it, so standardize the Russian language, have, then write, write a Russian language dictionary. And in your Russian language dictionary, have all kinds of nice definitions of words which are very pleasant for Ukrainians. Then have a Russian language encyclopedia and so on. Create the cultural resources which other people can use. Another thing to do, which many Ukrainians are already doing in certain ways, is to have a, a, central, a central place that reports in Russian on the Russian Federation, right? Create an alternative journalistics resource for Westerners, but also for Russians and people in the Russian-speaking world about Russia. And then a third thing to do is to welcome people for whom Russian is the first language, whether they're Russians or Belarusians or whatever, invite them to Ukraine if they happen to be political immigrants, have them write their novels here, and so on and so forth. This is, I don't mean this to weaken Ukrainian culture. It's not, a, it's not a rivalry. I mean it as a way to project Ukraine out into the world in what is a world language, right? Russia, if we think of Russia as the language of the Russian Federation only, then we're losing because that means they get to control everything. If we think of Russian as a world language, that means that everybody in the world gets to decide how it's going to be used. So I'm not saying, I mean, Ukrainska kultura vazhlivsha dla mene niz horosijska kultura, mova vazhlivsha dla mene niz horosijska mova. I think that Ukrainian, that, that Ukraine is in a position to I mean, for its own, in its own interest, to project outwards using the Russian language. You can't project outwards using Ukrainian, but you can project outwards using Russian. And then, not in your interest, but in general, I mean, I actually mean this very sincerely, I think it's sad that, the Russian, that Russian culture is now monopolized by the Russian Federation. I just think that's a sad thing for civilization as a whole. It would be better if other countries also were trying to create a notion of Russian civilization and not just the Russian Federation with its present government. So I hope that answers your question. Yeah. Thank you. 
And, uh, and do we have time or not? Yeah, because, yeah. Okay, my assistant told me we don't have time, but you are so generous. Uh, last, because it's not a question about how many questions, it's about uh, how much time Timothy Snyder is happy to spend for his wonderful answers. Okay, last most wonderful question, please. Uh, most wonderful? Okay. Okay, go ahead. No, no. Mike? Okay. Mike. <laughs> My name is Mary, and first of all, thanks for the amazing speech. Thanks for the opportunity to be there. And my question is, as you talked about the culture, Ukrainian culture and politics, my questions close these two topics, to these two topics. Um, you said that in European Union, probably they don't know them, but they wanted to see Ukraine as a part. But unfortunately, the thing that happened in Ukraine um, now I, I want to talk and to mention, as you probably all know, filmmaker Alex Sov, as you may know. Why, if European Union wanted to see us as a part, as a family, um, uh, I can hardly believe they, uh, the situation which happened with Alex Sov. Uh, he is a prisoner in Russia. Uh, why? All the government all over the Europe can just do something with this. Why everyone is so afraid of Russia? Thanks. Okay, thank you very much for your... Of course. Very strong, very important question. Yeah. No, so, I mean, of course, I'm completely on your side. It's, there should not be Ukrainian political prisoners anywhere. And there should, certainly shouldn't be Ukrainian political prisoners in foreign countries. It's a, it's, a grotesque, it's a grotesque situation and an awful situation and one that I've personally tried to do something about in the small ways that I can. I, I think the, we can't, I, I wasn't saying that the Europeans want to have Ukraine as a member of the family. That wasn't my point. My point was a different one. My point was that the Europeans need a future. That's what they need. And insofar as Ukraine can provide something that looks like a future, that's an asset for you. It, 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 I mean, it, it, sadly, Europeans right now, there are two problems. The first is Europeans vastly underestimate their own power. So the European Union is the greatest power in the history of the world not to realize that it is one. Um, and the second problem is that there really are, as you know, I'm sure very well, there really are various kinds of dependencies, personal, financial, um, and, uh, and, and in, in, in energy with the Russian Federation. So, I mean, I, there are lots of reasons to favor an, uh, a, a, an energy revolution. <laughs> And one of them is that it would force a regime change in the Russian Federation, um, and that it would it would free the European Union from some of its present entanglements. I, I I agree with you about Sensov. I mean, I agree with you completely about political prisoners. I think this is an issue of principle. Um, but in terms of politics, you can't expect the Europeans to be ideal partners. They're not. What they are is the is the is the best thing that's available, right? And when you're inside the European Union, things will start to look, on these issues too, things will start to look very, very different. I mean, I think there are only two alternatives in the world, really. I mean, in, in, in not just in this part. Empire and integration. And when integration does better, empire is going to do worse. And th things like invading other people's countries and taking their best and brightest people and putting them in prison are going to become harder. I agree with you. It's a, it's a tragedy and one has to take a principled stand on it. That I agree with you completely about. Now I gotta go. Uh, dear friends, let's join, please join me. Thank you. Thank you very much.